Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, church. It's so, um, such a great thing that we have the technology to gather together this morning and worship. I'm so thankful for Jason and Melissa leading us in worship this morning, reminding us of that um, incredible truth about how our God is greater than any circumstance that we come across, then also reminding us today that we need to proclaim our need for the Lord. It's just something that we need to do. We need him. I'm so thankful that Jason and Melissa are able to lead us in worship. And I just want you to know as well that you know, Jason and Melissa, if you're just tuning in on this time, you're saying they're not social distancing properly. They're married. They live in the same house. They can sing close to each other. So thankful for them and their willingness to lead us this morning. As we talk about worship, we don't just worship through song. I know we're all in our living rooms. It's a little bit different. We want to worship through singing God's Word. We want to worship through studying God's Word. We also want to worship through giving. And so one thing I want to challenge you all to do this morning, at this point in time during our service, I just want to invite you to go online. You can go to our um, website and you can give online there. You can pull up the app on your phone. You can give through the app. It will connect you to the site to give. So we want to challenge you at this moment to give your tithes and your offerings to support God's church, to support His kingdom moving forward. It's important for us to continue to give and see God's mission continue forward, even in these times of uncertainty with this pandemic. We want to pray and ask that as an act of worship, you would give to the Lord. You can also mail in a check to the church if you want to do things that way. Also, we're asking you not just to give to the church, but also giving above your regular tithes and offerings. This week is our, our emphasis, a week of prayer for North American missions. And specifically, our church has set a goal of $12,500 give to the Annie Armstrong Easter offering. That offering, that fund, 100% of those funds go to the North American Mission Board and go to church planting, church revitalization, go to missionaries in North America and in Canada. So we'd ask that you consider giving to that. You know, our staff talked and we said, well, we're not going to have people in the sanctuary. Giving's probably going to go down. Maybe we need to reduce this. We said, no, we prayed, we sought the Lord, and we know right now there are church planters, there are missionaries all over North America who are depending on that fund. So I'd ask for you to pray now and say, how can I give towards the Annie Armstrong Easter offering? How can I give towards it? And also, how can we pray? You know, we can worship through giving, worship through song. We also worship through prayer. And one way that we can do that in these uncertain times of this pandemic is every night, Monday through Friday at 7 p.m., our church is going live on our Facebook page and having a time of prayer. We'd invite you to join in with us at that time. But we're going to have a special emphasis of prayer for North American missions this whole entire week as we think about just how badly our nation needs Christ. You know, we're praying that this pandemic might be something that will draw people to Him. We might see another great awakening, another, another revival happen that God could use this for his good. So I ask you to join us in prayer. And even right now, as you're watching online, you can interact with us on Facebook. We have staff members on Facebook. Just share a prayer request or a praise, if you like, on our page. We'll be sure to pray for you. Know that we are in this together. We are better together. And though we might be gathering virtually via live stream, and though this sanctuary is kind of empty and it's a little bit odd, we know that God is still with us and his spirit is still at work. So we pray that you would go ahead and worship God through prayer this morning. So let's just do that before we turn our attention to God's word. God, we love you. We're so thankful for this opportunity we have to gather together this morning, wherever we are engaged with this live stream. We're just thankful, Lord, for the opportunity to gather together. Lord, I'm thankful for Jason and Melissa and for their, them leading us to the throne this morning. This reminder, Lord, that we just need to cry out how we need you this morning. Lord, how we need to surrender every aspect of our lives to you. And Lord, how we know that you are worthy of that because you are greater, you're higher than any other. So Lord, I pray those would not just be songs that we sing, but Lord, that those words would permeate into our hearts. We'd be reminded of who you are and what you've done for us. Lord, we pray that you'd bless 
those that are giving now. Lord, we know an economic downturn, it can be hard, but we just pray you'd bless those people who would faithfully give to you and your mission. And we pray, Lord, for missionaries around North America right now, Canada. Lord, we pray that they would be able to still be on mission for you and at work, Lord, even in the midst of this pandemic. And we do pray, Lord, for healing on our nation, for healing on this world. We pray, Lord, that you'd work in a miraculous way and bring this to an end. But in everything, Lord, we trust you. We're thankful for your son, Jesus, and the hope that we have in him. It's in his name we pray, Lord. Amen. Well, if you have your Bible, we're going to be in the book of Nehemiah again this morning. The book of Nehemiah, we're going to be in chapter 6. And just as a reminder, Nehemiah, regular guy, regular job, cupbearer for the king. God impresses it on him to go and to rebuild the wall in Jerusalem. He goes and he's been enduring a lot of obstacles and distractions through the first five chapters. Last week, we looked at even some internal issues of people taking advantage of others who are in hard times. And we said, even in the midst of a pandemic, are you going to exploit others, take advantage of others, or are you going to serve others? So Nehemiah has been combating all of these different issues. He's kept on mission for God through it all. But now we see that he's going to have another distraction, another obstacle placed in his path as he has enemies who decide to step up and decide, well, they tried to attack Jerusalem as a whole. They tried to affect the community. It wasn't working. The wall is getting rebuilt. So now they turn their attacks to Nehemiah personally. And they decide that they are going to do whatever it takes to get Nehemiah off his mission and to, and to keep Nehemiah, really prevent Nehemiah from completing the task that God has called him to. And this is something that we see time and time again through Scripture. There are times when Satan decides Maybe he doesn't defeat us by bringing us into sin, but maybe he can defeat us through distraction and getting us off mission, getting us focused on things that don't really matter. And so with that in mind, with distraction being an issue, we're going to read from Nehemiah chapter 6. I'm going to read the first nine verses this morning. This is what God's Word says, Nehemiah chapter 6. When Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem, the Arab... And the rest of our enemies heard that I'd rebuilt the wall and that there was no gap left in it, though at the time I had not installed the doors and the city gates. Sanballat and Geshem sent me a message. Come, let's meet together in the villages of the Ono Valley. They were planning to harm me. So I sent messengers to them saying, I'm coming down, excuse me, I'm doing important work and cannot come down. Why should the work cease when I leave it and go down to you? Four times they sent me the same proposal, and I gave them the same reply. Sanballat sent me this same message a fifth time by his aide, who had written an open letter in his hand. In it was written, it's reported among the nations, and Geshem agrees that you and the Jews plan to rebel. This is the reason you're building the wall. According to these reports, you are to become their king, and have even set up the prophets in Jerusalem to proclaim on your behalf, there is a king in Judah." These rumors will be heard by the king, so come, let's confer together. Then I replied to him, there's nothing to these rumors you are spreading. You are inventing them in your own mind. For they are all trying to intimidate us, saying they will drop their hands from the work and it will never be finished. But now, my God, strengthen my hands. Let's pray. God, we love you. We are thankful for your word. We do pray, Lord that we would not be distracted, that we would not get off mission. We pray, God, in the midst of struggle, Lord, that you would strengthen our hands. Lord, that we would stay on mission. Lord, that we would stay focused on you. God, we pray for the next few moments, you turn, Lord, our heart's affection, our mind's attention to you and your word. We ask, Lord, that you'd speak. We love you. It's in your son's name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Distractions. This is what Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem, they resort to. They said, we're going to distract Nehemiah. We're going to get him off mission. We're going to do whatever we can to get him away. 
from doing the work that God has called them to do. We all know that distractions can come in many ways, shapes, and forms. So my daughter, Avi, is 19 months old, and she's just developed just the cutest thing. Just recently, last couple weeks, she's learned how to run. And it's, it's adorable because her feet kind of pitter-patter, and she runs, and she loves doing it. It's super cute. But the issue is she really wants someone to chase her while she runs. So as my daughter is running, instead of looking where she is going, she is looking back to see if my wife or myself or one of our boys is going to chase after her. So this has led to Aviana running into furniture and into walls. It's been special. Luckily, she's still, you know, slow enough that there's not a major issue in the collision, but eventually there will be bruises and broken bones if she keeps this up. You see, she instead of saying focus on where she's running, she gets distracted and seeing will someone chase her. So now it's kind of like a game where Jill and I have to sprint to try to grab her before she runs into furniture, trips over something, runs into a wall. It's a lot of fun, let me tell you. But Avi gets easily distracted. She keeps her eyes. Instead of focusing on what she needs to focus on, she looks back and gets distracted. And we could say, well, yeah, she's a 19-month-old. She's a toddler. That's what they do. But you know, it's interesting. All of us can get distracted pretty easily as well, can't we? There's a study by a St. Louis-based senior living community provider, Provision Living, here in St. Louis, did this study on smartphones. So everybody has one of these, right? And let's be honest, in this time of social distancing, these are very effective tools. But they also can be a distraction. You see, this study showed, surveying American adults, the average American adult spends 5.4 hours a day on their smartphone. That's a lot of time, right? 5.4 hours a day. Now before, some people say, well, yeah, that's just millennials or Gen Z. Understand this. Yes, millennials, those 5.7 hours, but even the boomer generation, the average is five hours a day on a smartphone. And yes, it can be a great tool. In fact, we'd encourage you even right now, pull up our app and you can get the sermon notes and you can fill them in on our app, on our smartphone. It can be a tool that can be used for good, but just like any good thing, if we're not careful, it can become an idol. It can especially be used to distract us. Are there other times when you're hard at work and you hear the ping of a notification, you go to check your phone, and the next thing you know, you've lost your train of thought? There's, in fact, there's a book and research done. It's called Deep Work. And it talks about the importance of being able to turn off your phone for a while, turn off notifications even on your computer about emails, other things like that, so you can get focus in and do the deep work that you need to do. See, I believe that what the enemy does is, yes, he wants us to sin, but sometimes when he can't get us to do those sins, what he wants to simply do is just distract us from the mission that God has given us. And we're going to see that's exactly what happens to Nehemiah as they're trying to get him distracted. And so one of the things we see from this text from Nehemiah 6 is one of the first things we need to do to stay on mission for God is that we need to avoid distractions. We need to avoid distractions. Nehemiah is working for God. And then these guys come out, Sanballat, Geshem, they ask him, come, let's meet together in the villages of the Ono Valley. They're saying, let's get together. This is really political softball. Okay, they failed on their attempt to stop the wall builders. Now the gates, the doors are out to be put in. Everything's going to be completed. They're on the final lap of this building project. And so they decide they want to subtly persuade Nehemiah. This is political softball. It's Nehemiah, we're going to bury the hatchet. This is our concession speech. You've done it. You've built the wall. Good job. Now come hang out with us here on the Gaza Strip, on the beach, and let's meet together. Let's talk it out. But what is Nehemiah's response? I sent messengers to them saying, I'm doing important work and cannot come down. Why should the work cease? when I leave it and go down to you. Saying, God has called me to do this work. Why should I abandon what God has called me to do to go and meet with you all? 
he notices it's a distraction. This is something we have to understand. We need to be wary when people ask us to do things that make us neglect our own responsibilities. Be wary when people ask you to do things that make you neglect your responsibilities. Might sound like a good thing. Your kid is asked to be on the travel team. Well, all of a sudden you realize you're going to miss a whole lot of Sundays of gathering together and worshiping as a church family. You have to consider those things. Is it making you uh, neglect the responsibilities that God has given you? Maybe you're offered this promotion at work, but it means you're going to travel so much that you're going to neglect your family. You know, that might just be a distraction. You have to use discernment and think about those things. And Nehemiah does that. He says, no, I know what God has called me to do. So I'm not going to go. I'm not going to stop working. I'm going to lead the charge. I'm going to continue to invest. You know, life on mission is focused on the right priorities. It's focused on the right priorities. There could have been a priority for Nehemiah to think, hey, I've been working really hard my whole time in Jerusalem. These enemies of mine, they want to bury the hatch, and they're inviting me down here to Ono, which Gaza Strip on the beach. It's really a resort area in the ancient Near East. Would have been pretty nice. And yet, you know what Nehemiah does? Wait for it. Nehemiah says, oh no, to oh no. <laughs> I had to get in the dad joke, just making sure you're listening. I had some like audible boos in the first service. Now I appreciate, you know, some laughter. I, I cracked myself up with that one, okay? So Nehemiah says, oh no, to oh no. But then do they give up? No, look what, ha look what it says. It says that they four times, verse four, four times they sent me the same proposal and I gave them the same reply. Four different times. They're like, they're just going to wear him down, ask him again and again and again and again. And again, this is the tyranny of living in a house with a toddler. Okay, Avi is very persistent. One thing that she loves right now are smoothies. Little, we buy the little prepackaged yogurt smoothies. She loves those things. She calls them movies because she can't say smoothie yet. But she'll always come and she knows I'm the weak one, right? Supposed to only have one smoothie a day, according to my wife. And yet she comes up to me, looks at me with those big blue eyes, says, Daddy, movie. First couple times I'm like, you know, Avi, baby, no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, can't have the smoothie, can't have it. And she just wears me down again and again. Daddy, movie, daddy, movie. She loves those smoothies. She knows I'm the weak link, and so she wears me down, and she gets a second smoothie. Sorry, Jill. Okay? That's why we're almost out already. I'm going to have to brave social distancing at the grocery store to buy more smoothies for my daughter. But this is what the enemy does. He wants to wear us down, repeatedly throw distractions in our path, knock us off mission. And they went at their Nehemiah four different times. And he says, no, I'm not going to give in. Here's the thing. We, a life on mission, it's focused on the right priorities. You've got to stay focused on what God has called you to do. Don't get distracted. And also, don't give in to peer pressure. Just because so-called friends, co-workers, family members are telling you that you need to do this, if you know that it distracts you off the mission that God has given you, you need to be willing to not give in. We know there's social distancing, there's working from home, there's all these changes, and yet our mission has stayed the same. The great commandment, the great commission to love God, to love others. And the way we say it here at Fifi Baptist Church, it's to build and pursue. We want to build our lives on Jesus, and we want to pursue the good of the community where God has placed us. That has not changed. And so we want to stay on mission and not get distracted. Nehemiah stays on mission. So they change their tactics. Look at verse 5. Some Sanballat sent me the same message a fifth time by his aid, but what happens? Who had an open letter in his hand. In ancient Near East, there's two types of letters. There's one 
The normal way you do is you send a letter to a friend, you'd seal it with wax. And as it was sealed, then as it got to you, no, no one has read my mail. No one has opened this up. It's like sealing an envelope, right? Making sure it just gets to the person you want it to get. Or you'd send an open letter where anybody at any time could read it. So what Sinbalat does is he creates this false narrative that Nehemiah wants to be king of Jerusalem. Though Nehemiah was funded by King Artaxerxes in Persia, though he worked for him, though he got a decade off of work to go and rebuild the walls, though he had well, everything we can tell, a great relationship with the king of Persia, Sanballat wants to spread these lies that Nehemiah wants to be king, and that's why he's rebuilding the walls. So he does this in a community letter, so this letter is spread all over the place. As it's passed around, everybody's reading it, they're all talking about it, this rumor is spreading. They went from the political softball, let's bury the hatchet, to the political hardball of the smear campaign. We've all seen it, right? And yet what does Nehemiah do? He keeps praying and he keeps working. He keeps praying and he keeps working. He replies to him, verse 8, there's nothing to these rumors you're spreading. You're inventing them in your own mind. So Nehemiah's response to his enemy is threefold. First, he refutes the rumor. Then what happens? They're all trying to intimidate us. He says, saying they'll drop their hands from the work. He'll never be finished. And then we see he prays. But now, my God, strengthen my hands. He refuted the rumor. He prayed, and he kept on working. When you live on mission for God, when you're on fire for God, it puts you in Satan's crosshairs. It puts you in Satan's crosshairs. When you are boldly living for the Lord, when you're doing things for Him, when you're on mission, when you're radically sharing your faith, when you're living for the Lord in such a way that other people are noticing, Satan notices well, and all he wants to do is distract you from the mission. He can't get you to sin. He gets you distracted. But Nehemiah keeps praying. He keeps working. And his response is threefold. He refuted the rumor. So there's no truth to it. Notice he doesn't go into this huge thing, but he simply refutes it as there's no truth to it. Then he prays, my God, strengthen my hands, and he keeps on working. He keeps on working. I love that prayer that he has. You know, Nehemiah is an example, again, of what it means to have unceasing prayer, to pray continuously. We see throughout Nehemiah, sometimes it's long prayer, sometimes it's like this, it's little, small, just little popcorn prayer. It's just a little th expression that he says, little prayer to God. And in this one, it's a little prayer, but there's a whole lot of truth packed into it. He says, God, strengthen my hands. He knows that the task that God has called him to is something that he cannot do on his own. Think about Paul who has this thorn in his side. He says, God, remove this thorn from me. And what is God's response to Paul? He says, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in your weakness. When Nehemiah is praying, God, strengthen my hands, what he's admitting here is, in my own strength, in my own power, I cannot do what you've called me to do, God. And we might all be feeling that right now. It's just a different thing as we switch to living it really from our home, social distancing, changing how we work, changing our routines. All this thing has changed. But guess what? The mission that God has given us has not changed. And maybe some of us are saying, well, how do we do this? I know the church staff has been reevaluating how we do things each and every week. You know, I was just talking with Jason and Melissa as we were planning out the next couple of services. And they were kind of asking, well, how many songs do you think for next week? I said, well, we'll just see, right? We're trying to figure this out, trying to be flexible when we can, trying to make changes where we need to, just so we can stay on mission. But I think one good thing out of all of this is it's leading us on our knees to God constantly. We don't know what to do. There's no playbook out there. No church has experienced this. Yet we're all experiencing it simultaneously. How do we deal with this? How do we leverage technology? We're all trying to figure it out together. There's no guidebook. And just like Nehemiah, when things are stressful, we're not sure what to do, 
we need to get on our knees. We need to call out to God and say, my God, strengthen my hands. You see, Nehemiah took care of his character, but he trusted God to take care of his reputation. We need to worry about taking care of our own character. We need to live with integrity. Then we let God take care of our reputation. Well, they decide one more thing to try to distract Nehemiah. It says, he went to the house of Shemaiah, son of Deliah, son of Mehetabel, who was restricted to his house. And he said, let's meet at the house of God inside the temple. Let's shut the temple doors because they're coming to kill you. They're coming to kill you tonight. So here we see a guy. He had the stay-at-home orders, right? He's restricted to his house. Maybe he touched somebody who was exposed. I don't know. But he says, I've got this word from God for you. I've got this word from God. He tells Nehemiah, people are coming to kill you. This is probably pretty accurate. Nehemiah knows his life has been on the line. He's been living for God. Yet what we see here is Nehemiah uses discernment because what, look at what he says in verse 11. But I said, should a man like me run away? How can someone like me enter the temple and live? I will not go. I will not go. So we use discernment. Even if something sounds good, here's a prophet who it seems like from this text at some point in time had spoken for God in the past, and yet now he's been paid off, been bought off by Nehemiah's enemies. And this prophet says, Nehemiah, go hide in the temple, shut yourself in there, then you'll live. But this is what Nehemiah does. He uses discernment because even if it sounds good, this is a good plan. Run, hide somewhere where there's actually doors, shut them, be safe. He tests it against God's word. You see, Nehemiah knew God's word well enough to know the rules and the restrictions in the Old Testament. The only people to go into the temple were priests. So what he realizes is that God will never ask you to do something that's contrary to his word. God will never ask you to do something that's contrary to his word. When your boyfriend comes and says, hey, come move in with me. We can save money on rent. Guess what? That's contrary to God's word. When you're behind on your bills and you think, you know what? I'll just take a little extra from my company. I can pay it back. Eventually everything will be fine. That's contrary to God's word. You know that God will never ask you to do anything that goes against his word. God doesn't change. So Nehemiah realizes, and see verse 12, I realized God had not sent him because of the prophecy he spoke against me. Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. Some people will sell out their God for money. We have to realize we compare everything and we look and we compare it to God's word, which has everything we need for life and godliness. And we let this be our standard. Now, if someone says they're a prophet or a pastor, we submit to God's word. He says, he was hired, so I'd be intimidated. Do as he suggested, sin and get a bad reputation in order that they could discredit me. He understands. He uses discernment. We see that he's in touch with the Lord. He knows God's word. He is not going to be distracted by this. But ultimately, look what it says. He ends with another prayer, second prayer of this chapter. My God, remember Tobiah and Sanballat for what they have done, and also the, prophet, the prophetess, Noadiah, and the other prophets who wanted to intimidate me. This is something that we see. Nehemiah responds by going to God. When we are frustrated, we take it to God. We talked about this last week. Many times when someone talks about us, the natural response is to talk right back. But when people talk about us, we talk to God. We take it to Him. We trust in God. When we are frustrated, when we are upset, when we don't know what to do, when it feels like the, our enemies are surrounding us, we go to God. And we trust in him. We know regardless of what anyone says about us, we need to care only what 
God says. So he prays, God, remember what they've done to me. He looks to God and he prays. Ultimately, we stay on mission by surrendering daily to God, by saying yes to his priorities and no to any distractions. Nehemiah realized what God had called him to do and he wasn't going to be distracted. Remember, we talked about this last week, but Nehemiah really just foreshadows. He points to Christ. And Christ, if you think about it, goes to the Garden of Gethsemane and prays and seeks God. And then though there are plenty of distractions and try to get him off his mission, Jesus keeps his eye on God, his Father. And he goes to the cross. Jesus was willing to endure the cross because he knew that is what was set out for him to do. And he endured that cross so you and I might be in right relationship with him. You know, Nehemiah couldn't go to the temple in the Old Testament because there's this big curtain. There's no way to enter into the Holy of Holies. There's no way to go into God's presence. But because of Christ's sacrifice on the cross, we can now go to the throne of grace at any time that we want. So whenever we feel distracted, whenever we feel frustrated, whenever we feel all of these things pressing on us, we keep our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, it says in Hebrews. So we remember what Christ did for us. And then as we remember that, we can, just like Nehemiah pray, we can say, but now God, strengthen my hands. We know God has called us to live on mission for him. We know that God has called us to be his ambassadors, to be his witness, to be a light. So we have to ask and pray for God to strengthen our hands. I just want you to know, if you're listening as I shared about what Christ did on the cross for us, if you just happen to tune in this live stream for some reason, you've never had a, uh, a decision to follow Jesus in your life, I'd love to talk with you about that. You can email me, or we have staff members actually online right now Just send a private message to our Facebook page. We'd love to talk with you about what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Maybe you just need to pray for strength in this time. All of us need, like Nehemiah, to not be distracted by everything around us. We need to stay on mission, doing what God has called us to do. Pray that God would strengthen your hands. Know that even in our weakness, God is strong. His grace is sufficient for us. But we need to pray together. Make sure we stay on mission, building and pursuing for the glory of God. Whatever it is that the Holy Spirit is working in your heart now, I just pray you go to him and know that we have staff members ready on that Facebook page. I'd love to talk with you. You can email me, call me, and we can talk about how we can avoid distractions and stay on mission. So I believe that God is allowing us to walk through this for a purpose. If we'll listen to him, we'll trust him, we'll pray and ask God to strengthen us, we know that he can bring beauty from ashes. Let's go to him in prayer this morning. God, we love you. We're thankful for your word. We pray, Lord Jesus, that you would strengthen the hands of your church. Lord, that we would be your hands and feet throughout this uncertain time in our world. God, we also pray if there's anyone in this place, Lord, watching online who's never made a decision to follow you, we pray, Lord Jesus, your spirit would be working in their hearts even now. God, we pray that we would not be distracted, but Lord, we'd be focused on living for you. We're so thankful for the hope that we have through your son, Jesus. We pray we represent him well the upcoming days. We love you, Lord. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.